All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Australia China Joint Workshop on Biodiversity Law and Governance today and tomorrow. My name is Nen Liu. Uh, I'm an associate professor here at Macquarie University Law School, and I'm also the outgoing director of the Center for Environment Law here at Macquarie. Uh, let's do the welcome to the country first, as a tradition of, of, of this conference and all the conferences here in Australia. So uh, let's play the uh, welcome to the country. Sarah, please. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So I also would like to acknowledge my 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 uh, the traditional owners of of traditional owners of the Macquarie University land where uh, I'm, I'm here today as uh, a Watamadagar clan of the Daru people. And also, I would like also to pay sincere respect to the elders past, present, and future. So this week is, is actually a very big week for a uh, convention on biological uh, diversity. If we are uh, doing the conference on biodiversity law and governance, this week is, is the fourth working group meeting for the conference of the, for the 15th of the conference of parties of the convention on biological uh, diversity so countries are getting together now in nairobi uh, kenya uh, where where the headquarters of the united nations environment environment program uh, is located to discuss and also to make the final preparation for the adoption of the post 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework which is uh, to be held uh, which is, was supposed to be held in China in the later uh, in the later part of this year, and anyway now there is a change. But in any in any in any uh, in any case, this is going to be a, a magnificent global uh, biodiversity uh, a framework uh, that will govern the international community communities' uh, response and reactions to save the planet in the next uh, years to come. So, uh, so. Uh, our first uh, opening speech will be delivered by uh, Professor Tian Baoqing, uh, who is the director of the Research Institute of Environmental Law uh, at Wuhan University. Uh, Tian Bao is also a part of the Chinese delegation to the CBD negotiation. And as you can imagine, now he is uh, right in Nairobi, and the, the time zone is, is midnight, I believe. So uh, Tian Bao has sent a recorded video uh, yesterday uh, to uh, greet, to, to provide his greetings to all the conference participants. So uh, let's go ahead with his speech first. Dear Professor Liu, dear Mr. Tsai, dear distinguished uh, professors and participants from China, Australia, and all over the world, welcome to this China, Australia Biodiversity Law and Governance Workshop. I'm sorry can, I, I cannot join you online directly because currently I'm now in Nairobi for the fourth meeting of the OEWG of the CBD for the purpose of the uh, global biodiversity framework. As you all know that both China and Australia are mega biodiversity countries. Uh, these two countries have uh, both important 
roles in conserving biodiversity at the national level and the international level. For example, for China, China has took already the legislative, administrative, and the judicial measures to protect, protect the biodiversity. We have already more than 50 laws and regulations, and we have a Ministry of uh, uh, Ecological and uh, Environment, we have a Ministry of uh, Natural Resources, and uh, several other ministries for the protection of uh, uh, biodiversity. We must to say that the uh, environmental judicial protection of the biodiversity, currently we have already more than 2,000 environmental courts and tribunals all around the, the China. They use the public interest litigation to conserve, in, to conserve the uh, biodiver biological diversity. Uh, in addition, China has very important uh, role in international level to protect the biodiversity. I think the uh, Australia have a similar efforts in this regard. I believe this workshop provides a wonderful platform for the participants and the, the uh, listeners to communicate, to share their ideas, their experience, their lessons for legally protection of biodiversity. I hope the meeting we will have a very success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Tim Baoqing. And uh, this workshop is made available uh, with very generous support of uh, Australian government's National Foundation for Australia-China Relations. Uh, without the support of foundation, uh, it would be very difficult for us to, to fund this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, significant uh, event between uh, the two countries. And we are very fortunate today to have the CEO of the foundation, uh, Mr. Peter Tsai, uh, here with us. So now let me uh, invite Mr. Tsai to uh, deliver uh, his uh, speech to the audience. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to see you all here at Australia China Joint Workshop on Biodiversity and Governance. I wish to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you for the lands of the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and I pay my respect to the oldest past, present, and emerging. Uh, my name is Peter Tsai. I'm the CEO of National Foundation for Australia China Relation, a position I took up last year, December last year. The National Foundation for Australia China Relation is a national platform that engages government, business, and the communities to support and to find ways to engage constructively with China across the greater China and to involve Australia's diverse stakeholders and communities. The foundation is very pleased to be supporting this event, which covers such an important area of cooperation between Australia and China. Biodiversity is critical to our social and economic prosperity, but it faces enormous challenges. In 2022, the World Economic Forum asked experts and world leaders across business, governments, and the civil societies what they saw as the most um, severe risk to our globe over the next 10 years. Biodiversity came up third, um, trailing only behind extreme weathers and the failure to act on climate um, change. I think uh, one of my favorite story, which I would like to share here, I think is very well known um, to the Chinese um, uh, put, uh, to the Chinese uh, people, uh, which is the the story of the famous Chinese agriculture scientist, the late Yuan Longping, um, who who is the who was the father of uh, the super rice in China, and uh, a part of uh, um, his great scientific work was the discovery of a wild strain of rice next to a railway line in Hainan in 1970s. And that laid to the scientific and the genetic foundation uh, of the, the, the so-called super rice, which really revolutionized, re revolutionized the rice production globally and contributed enormously to the global alleviation of hungers and the properties. I think one can only speculate what would happen if this um, wild strain was not preserved. Um, so um, on that note, um, it is important workshop like this um, are very important to meeting the daunting global challenges that transcend borders 
as two of the largest nations with a mega diverse ecosystem, it is natural for Australia and China to exchange ideas on common challenges and to benefit from each other's expertise. Both our nations possess um, diverse flora, fauna, and a thriving marine ecosystem that are threatened by climate change, habitat loss, and pollution. Our ability to tackle these cha challenges will benefit from dialogue and collaboration to find innovative solutions to difficult problems. I'm confident this workshop will make an important contribution by bringing together some of Australia's and China's leading specialists on biodiversity. You are fortunate over the next two days to hear from the distinguished speakers from cross-policy academia and NGOs. And you will gain insights from practitioner on ground on challenges and lessons learned covering everything from multilateral treaties to best practices for protecting migratory birds. You will have a fantastic two days ahead of you. This workshop is a strong example of a positive practical engagement between Australian and the Chinese institutions and experts. I wish you all the best of luck for your discussions and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for your, for your warm wishes and, and also for your thoughts on the Australia-China uh, relations uh, when it comes to biodiversity uh, law and governance. So before we jump into uh, our today's uh, panel one discussion, uh, let me elaborate uh, a little bit further uh, to you, to all of you, about why uh, did I initiate this, this workshop, this joint workshop. I mean, let's be frank, the so Australia-China relations has been strained over the past few years. And uh, I mean, there are lots of things going on and we don't really need to uh, touch upon them. But the thing is, when it is very ironic, so there are two things here. First, it is very ironic because these days we are supposed to live in a hyper-connected world, which means it is very easy for people to connect for people from different parts of the world to connect with each other with this kind of enhanced technology. But on the other hand, what I see, uh, what I see uh, what's going on in the recent years is the meaningful and subst substantive connections between the two countries are declining rapidly. So that's the first thing first. And then the second thing is, let's when, 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 we go, when we go beyond the bilateral relations, if we just uh, kind of uh, opened up our eyes to see the big picture, the planet, our planet, that the, our shared planet is now in, in deep and profound environmental crisis. As Peter mentioned, we, we are having extreme weather, human-induced climate change, and all, also we are having this biodiversity crisis. It, it, it is truly a crisis. Some scientists would even argue that we are facing the sixth mass extinction, which means according to the, according to the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, they produced a global assessment report in 2019 regarding the, the status of the, of the global biodiversity. And, and the prediction is very dreadful because if we don't do anything, if we just leave it as business, uh, leave it as business as usual, then one million species are facing extinction or have already extincted. So what does this mean? This means, see, these days uh, we have already heard a lot of voices and also a lot of hopes about climate actions, uh, especially when it comes to reduction of the greenhouse gas emission that is the cause of the climate change. I have some uh, very limited, but also uh, also still some hope that we can revert this climate, climate crisis if we reduce, significantly reduce the greenhouse gas emission. But the problem with the biodiversity is, is different. So biodiversity or ecosystem underpins of human society, underpins of our, our economic, social, and cultural life. But once we lose the species, we, we lose them forever. So once so this, this word extinction is actually very dreadful because once we lose something, they will never come back, be it whales or sharks or, 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 or pandas. So, you know, this is something I think for, for countries like Australia and China is something we ought to continue 
and, and deepen our conversation and to find, to exchange ideas and find solutions to address this common challenge. So that is behind my idea and my, why I have been keen to initiate this kind of workshop is to start the conversation and also to build this meaningful and a substantial connection for countries, for the top uh, scientists and, and scholars and NGOs uh, from the both countries to, to, to address this common concern. So that is the idea behind. And we can see that there are some hope now with, with the new Australian government, with the new Chinese ambassador to Australia, we have seen this, this so-called reset of the Australia-China relations. So I, I sincerely hope that this workshop will create this kind of positive vibe for, for people from both countries, for, for scholars from both countries to, to, to start a conversation and to build this network. And also I must say, I'm very much uh, touched by the warm response from, from uh, colleagues and friends in the two countries. Since we, we, initially, we, we published the call for papers only about a month ago, and we started inviting speakers, and also uh, then, then also we finalized our program on Friday last week, and guess how many registrations we have today? In two days time, we have received more than 150 registrations from both countries. And also we are more, and also this workshop, this idea is warmly received by, by all the speakers from Australia and China and chairs. So I think this showcase already that once we can, we can even get this workshop started today is already a, a, a positive and encouraging sign that the people from the both countries they can be divided apart by politics, but they can also be connected with common interests and the common concerns. So with this, I'm very much hopeful that the dialogues between the two countries on shared concerns will continue. And also, once again, I'm very grateful uh, with the support of, not, of the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations, in particular, uh, uh, Mr. Peter Tsai. I think the foundation uh, also shares my vision to find this slightly odd topic, like biodiversity. So the thing is, in the wider world, and I, I know that most people actually don't understand what is biodiversity, but let's talk about nature. Let's talk about migratory birds. And also I would, like to, I would like to conclude my opening speech by reminding you that we deliberately picked up that, that, that bird picture as our in our pro promotional material because that is a migratory bird. They have countries, they have habitats in both countries. They were in China during the, during the summertime and came Australia for the winter time. So, you know, birds are like that. People should be the same. So, so let's start the conversation and I wish all of you a, a very successful two days conference. And also I hope people can learn and in, can learn from this workshop and also kind of uh, through the engagement we've been inspired by how we can better save our, our planet. So I will stop here and thank you once again. So now I, I would suggest we can just go straight into our uh, panel one today. And I see that our chair, Dr. Michelle Ling, uh, is already there and also all the panelists are ready. So uh, Michelle, uh, the floor is yours and we can get start our serious and substantial uh, conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nengye, and thank you for all of you your wonderful welcomes and setting the scene for what it is, why have we come together today? And I'm delighted and honored to chair this session, a very topical session as discussions are ongoing, not quite as we speak. I think the delegates uh, and negotiators are probably having a good rest as they gear up for the next phase of discussions of the post-2020 framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity. So this first panel this morning brings together experts from Australia and from China to really dig into this important topic on the global biodiversity framework. A little bit of um, housekeeping. Each speaker will have 15 minutes. I'll introduce them just before 
they speak. And as Ningye has highlighted, as Peter has also spoken to, the main purpose of our coming together of these next two days is to stimulate discussion, connection. And so a key part of this panel will be the discussion section at the end. And all of you listening, we want your voices as well. So we'll have each presentation for 15 minutes and then allow for one burning question for each panelist and ultimately to have that, to have everyone come together at, at the end to have a, a dialogue, Australia-China dialogue on the opportunities for the post-2020 framework. And first up, I'm really happy to introduce to you James Trezice, who's currently the Conservation Director at the Invasive Species Council. I, the last time I met James in person was in March 2020, as the world was starting to change. And we were at, I think it was then, the second or the third um, open working group meetings in Rome, and little did we know how the world would change after that. We're delighted to have James here today, having that range of experience across conservation biology, across policy, across a range of NGO and other policy frameworks. I'll read out to you because it really is really important to today's discussion, some of the things that James has been involved with, currently the Conservation Director at the Invasive Species Council, previously at the Australian Conser Conservation Foundation, has worked as part of the IUCN, um, Australian Committee of the IUCN, and um, the Research Conservation Committee for BirdLife Australia to bring about discussions about what we really need to do for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And it's been a privilege of mine to get to know James and as someone who really, really cares about why we need to change policy, change the, the global biodiversity framework to do something to address these fundamental challenges of our times. So I'd now like to come to James's topic who will talk, and, and James Trezice will be talking to us about an Australian NGO perspective on an, an ambitious, we hope, global biodiversity framework. James, over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and uh, wow, what a <clears throat> introduction. <laughs> hard to hard to top that. All right, I'll just uh, we check we tested the tech before, and let's just make sure that this is working. Share. Hopefully, can I just. You can see the slide deck there for thumbs up. Yep, all good. So yes, uh, I won't go over who I am. Michelle's done that for me. Thanks everyone. It's always quite strange doing these things digitally, but we're all quite accustomed to it over the past two years. And yes, the last time I was uh, caught up with Michelle was in the, in the throes of OEWG2 uh, as an observer, as an NGO observer in Rome, just as the world started to dramatically shift and we had to get out of Rome in a big hurry. So today I'm gonna to be talking about, I guess, Australia's, um, uh, an NGO's perspective on the global biodiversity framework. And I think it's quite important because We'll go in, I'll go into it in a, a lot more detail, but the conventional biological diversity is quite central to Australia's uh, environmental policy landscape. Um, but before we jump into the, the particulars of, of CBD policy and, and the convention and the global biodiversity framework, I think it's really important to contextualize why this matters. And we've had a bit of a discussion about it um, so far or, or some, talks about why why biodiversity matters but from a from a Australian perspective we are certainly in the grips of what you'd consider a biodiversity and extinction crisis um, we are the we are far above what any kind of background rate of extinction should be under natural circumstances and there's some really important research that's come out in recent years that I just wanted to profile which kind of really tells that story at a at a, at a national level so the first is this um, 
important paper that came out in uh, 2021 on um, collapsing ecosystems across Australia. And, and what these authors did was identify that there are currently 19 different ecosystem types, and you can see them there mapped out on the map of Australia uh, with those numbers, which are uh, showing signs or in the process of collapse. And what that means is those ecosystems will uh, fail to operate as they have in the past. And we've got a, a range of different drivers there. So you can see things like the Great Barrier Reef, where we know that there's been six uh, bleaching events now on the Great Barrier Reef in the past kind of eight years, I think it is. And that is going to have dramatic knock-on effects to how that how the Great Barrier Reef continues um, to thrive into the future or not. Uh, there are a lot of other drivers and climate change is certainly one of the most um, uh, pervasive uh, in terms of the dri uh, drivers on um, those ecosystem collapses. But you can also see that in that gray, in that dark gray column, we've also got a range of human impact pressures such as habitat change, invasive species, which is kind of my focus at the moment uh, in my current role, uh, as well as over extraction of water um, and lives and overgrazing and over utilization for livestock. So there's a range of human uh, driven pressures and of, of course, climate change is a human driven, driven pressure as well. So that's from an ecosystem perspective, but then when we can look at uh, what it means in terms of uh, biodiversity and, and at a species level, well, you get a very similar picture. And so this was another study released uh, in 2021, last year, uh, which looks at uh, the specific drivers for Australia's almost 2000 listed threatened species. Uh, and what is driving the declines or what is driving the endangerment of those threatened species. And so these are species that are listed at the national level. And on the left, you can see, so this is done by Ward et al. And on the left, you can see there that there is a whole range of factors and drivers and each one of those uh, light bars is on the star graph there, uh, demonstrates the impact and high, the higher the impact, you can see that those purple medium impact and there's a, there's a the paper unpacks the, the rationale for those drivers. But when you boil it down, it really comes down to there are, there are four major drivers of biodiversity decline in Australia. Uh, we've got habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation, uh, invasive species and disease, which are actually probably the highest impact driver. Uh, when you look at the, the red there, you can see that they, the invasive species are probably one of the largest drivers of species level decline. But then of course, we've got adverse fire regimes and climate change and severe weather. Now climate change and severe weather is probably underreported just simply because the some of the biophysical sciences haven't caught up completely with the impact of climate change on biodiversity. And as we saw from that previous uh, slide, climate change is disrupting entire ecosystems. And so that's gonna have obvious knock on effects to, to biodiversity and species level conservation. What does that mean? Uh, well, Australia does have an extinction crisis because we've seen three vertebrates go extinct since 2009. That's the Christmas Island pipistrelle, the Christmas Island forest skink and the Bramble K melamus on the right there. Uh, two of those were driven by invasive species. The last one driven by climate change and habitat degradation associated with climate change. In 2010, the koala, was not even on the list of threatened species for Australia. Like it wasn't even on the radar. At the time I was in the federal um, environment department and, and there was no real concern around the decline in the koala. Just last, just this year, actually, beginning of this year, that species has been now got up, been uplisted from vulnerable, which was listed in 2012, to endangered, particularly in the um, East Coast populations. And uh, there was a Senate inquiry which says that there's a high risk that it goes extinct in, in New South Wales uh, by 2050. So that's a really iconic species that there's probably a lot of international awareness for. What, what's right next to that is a, a critically endangered species called the grassland dealless dragon, which most people wouldn't have heard of, but it's very likely that the grassland dealless dragon is going to be the first vertebrate extinction acknowledged on mainland Australia for a reptile. Uh, and so that's a, a, that this particular individual is from a, a, a species that's in now been separated and is in the um, is safe, but the, the population down in Victoria is very likely extinct. So why does it all matter what that that's contextualizing why the CBD is important. 
The CBD is central to Australian government's authority on environmental matters. So uh, talking law and governance and probably most people on this call would be somewhat aware of this, but the Australian constitution doesn't talk about the environment at all. And the primary authority on which uh, the Australian government intervenes or funds or regulates environmental impacts is actually based on its external affairs power. And the CBD gives it very broad powers to intervene to protect, conserve, list and um, restore populations of both threatened species and biodiversity more generally. And of course, um, the manifestation of the, the CBD in terms of domestic policy is Australia's National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, which there's a cover shot of it there, which is Australia's strategy for nature in 2019 and 2030. Now, that's probably where the kind of background context setting um, stops and we start kind of unpacking some of the learnings and lessons from, from where we're at with the CBD. Now, in 2010, we had the Aichi targets. And in Australia, look, I, I there was a previous um, version of the strategy for nature called Australia's Biodiversity Conservation Strategy, which had a whole, which was our previous NBSAP. Uh, and it never really connected well with the Aichi targets, but at the same time, there was never really any uh, ambition or policy driver domestically to meet our Aichi targets. So one of the first lessons I think for the CBD and, and where we're at now is that we have to learn them from the mistakes of what happened in the 2010s um, and the process towards meeting those uh, Aichi targets. On the right there, you can see uh, a, a front page of one of our major newspapers from 2018, which demonstrates that when we can uh, highlight and profile these things, people pay attention. And that was uh, when the first version of Australia's NBSAP was released just prior to Christmas uh, with very low ambition for biodiversity. And um, the media took quite uh, a bit of umbrage with that. So the lessons from the 2010s on where, kind of what went like a bit of a, a forensic examination of what quite didn't work from the CBD perspective for driving ambition. So we've had these extinctions, we've got ecosystems in decline, Australia's uh, biodiversity protection framework is not working. And, uh, and the CBD didn't really drive the change that needed to happen um, through the 2010s under the IHE framework. I think the first thing having been involved in CBD for a fair bit is it's a very, it's very clubby and it's a very, um, they call it the CBD family, um, but that insular nature can be a really significant barrier to mainstreaming. So how do we get more people engaged, uh, aware and um, uh, thinking about what the CBD means for improving biodiversity protections uh, in, in various um, state jurisdictions? One of the challenges, um, in doing that, like I guess one of the manifestations of that for me was at Rome, uh, the post, the, at the end of the OED, OEWG2 workshop, there was a media conference and I just went along because I wanted to see who, who's engaging in this, who's, who's paying attention to the CBD from a, from a I guess, a outside the club and one journalist turned up. And, you know, that's in a really accessible place for a lot of uh, particularly European media, but just generally media. Uh, of course, there was the, the kind of growing nature of COVID, but I think it, it's emblematic of the lack of engagement um, through the CBD. I think it's well understood that there's a lack of compliance and, a, and accountability through the CBD framework itself. And that's problematic because there aren't really the policy levers to drive um, uh, states meeting their, their requirements. Uh, from an advocacy perspective, um, the CBD cannot be a set of forget. I think that's a key thing for at least in Australia, one of the challenges domestically uh, over the 2010s. Um, you need to continue to be vigilant and make sure that there is accountability for what commitments have been made to, to the convention and uh, especially you have to turn up and that can be problematic for a lot of observers and NGOs with limited budgets, limited resources, uh, as these, um, even in um, uh, developed nations that, you know, should theoretically have the resources at, at the costs start to stack up quite quickly. And so you really have to rely on your international networks. But on, on the flip side of that, 
so you know we've got this really club like uh uh kind of un body that's or or symposium or, or um collective that's negotiating these uh, agreements but at the same time in ngos we do a lot of social research and what we know is that australians intrinsically care and so time and time again we'll do polling or do focus groups and find that there is a deep connection between Australians and biodiversity and nature. Um, however, the, what there is a disconnect is that they don't, Australians don't quite understand the scale of the problem and the scale of the challenges that our natural environment face. In 2020, there was some social research done on Australians' perspectives on, uh, I guess, the global framework. And some of the results were really surprising, even for the people who are engaged in, in the work quite closely, which found that 87% um, of Australians thought that the Australian government should work with other nations to set clear and measurable targets and obligations to halt the extinction of wildlife globally. So that's 87% of Australians supporting a, a global goal to end extinctions. 89% um, thought Australian government should work with other nations to set clear and measurable targets to protect nature and restore nature globally. And 92% um, thought effort to protect and restore nature and halt the extinction of native wildlife should be um, a priority and equally shared across all nations. So I guess that tells you that there is a, like if Australia were to lean in and lead on biodiversity and conservation, it would be something that would be welcomed quite broadly by the public. Um, but I don't think our political cycle is really caught up with it. And that leads me to my last point, which is biodiversity is still viewed as a niche issue within the policy cycle and within policy circles. And so when we talk about environment in Australia, it's often through the lens of um, climate damage and climate impacts. And that's um, not discounting those things. But what we need to do is bring these two issues more closely and intrinsically linked together because they are. Uh, nature will be a critical solution to the climate change um, uh, dilemma and also uh, climate damage is going to severely impact our capacity to to protect and restore nature. Um, I'll just on climate damage and, and climate impacts I think that's also a unique challenge for CBD it's not on the slide deck there but uh, one of the, the really interesting things is when we look at Paris there's some clear transboundary impacts of CO2 emissions that are a common bond for uh, for nation states. Australia has 80% of its biodiversity is endemic. And so there isn't, it, it becomes more challenging in kind of creating this kind of unifying vision around uh, biodiversity uh, on a global stage when, you know, the grassland eel dragon, for example, is occupies one small patch. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it, it's that communication challenge. It's how do I get someone uh, in London or in uh, um, you know South Africa or in Beijing to care about the grassland eelus dragon that occurs in one small patch of Australia, and that there is that inherent challenge. So we have this unified challenge of biodiversity decline globally, but there is domestic differentiation around how those impacts manifest themselves, and that presents a, a communications challenge probably more than anything else. So where are we going to? Uh, there is a there's a huge amount of collaboration going on in the Australian NGO space at the moment. We made some strong representations to the Australian delegation just on Friday as they were jetting off towards Nairobi, um, and that is to say that Australia needs to be far more ambitious in what it's pushing for in the GBF, and the GBF itself needs to be far more ambitious. I think there is a lot of concern about backsliding from some of the targets in IHE. Um, we need a, a clear and unambiguous mission around what the GBF is for. And, you know, too often I've been observing the negotiations and seeing nation states um, aiming to, uh, I guess, make life easy for themselves. Uh, and what I mean by that is we need the GBF to drive change. It can't be something that just simply uh, whitewashes existing commitments. The other part of that is um, that second dot point there, which is around a commitment to halt human induced extinctions and reduce extinction risk by 2030. And that's one of the real um, backsliding events that we're seeing in the GBF towards compared to IHE. 
And the most concerning thing I think that came out of OEWG3 was a lot of pressure to start removing the quantifiable and accountable goals out of um, the GBF. And that is in itself um, probably one of the most problematic components because we know that if there isn't a compliance and ratchet mechanisms, it's going to be left to uh, kind of civil society or other actors to hold um, state parties to account for what they commit to doing. And if there isn't a really measurable um, uh, metric on which to hold or to drive even measuring these things. Some of these things aren't very well measured at the moment. Invasive species is a great example. Um, then it's going to be really hard to say that the GBF is going to drive change. So we need, you know, we talk about smart goals, um, or, you know, measurable goals, actionable, uh, and that, that are time bound. They need to be uh, absolutely part of the, the GBF framework. And so that's what we'll be going to be watching very closely uh, through the negotiations in Nairobi. Um, as mentioned, you know, there's a few uh, key elements and stronger focus on reducing extinction risk and, and maintaining abundance of non-threatened species in, in particular in target four. And also, you know, this really new, interesting part of the, the global biodiversity framework, which is factoring business considerations. And so making sure that there is a international policy driver and I think this is one of the, the really um, interesting components uh, of, the, of the, the framework is to say, can we use the GBF to start embedding um, policy drivers within businesses so that they can account for and disclose their impacts on nature? And of course, we've got the ta task force on <clears throat> nature, um, on TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, which will play an important role in this. And then, of course, there needs to be, oh, this is kind of widely accepted, a better integration of rights-based approaches and, and the roles of IPLCs throughout the convention text, um, uh, sorry, throughout the GBF text. And, and what we're uh, wanting to avoid is this perception and uh, that somehow that this overrides um, um, Indigenous peoples and locals communities rights. I think that would be um, a, 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 a known goal, so to speak, of the, of the, of the GBF. The GBF really needs to embed um, Indigenous people and local communities at the centre of conservation efforts. And we're not really seeing that at the moment. So I guess um, I'll, I'll finish up now, but where, where we're seeing Australia and the GBF go. As I mentioned, there's a significant amount of collaboration across the domestic and international NGO space, probably more than uh, I've observed previously in just in terms of the, the dialogue and you know sharing of views and opinions. Um, and that's really important for a place like Australia, which kind of uh, is, you know, geographically removed from where a lot of these discussions are taking place. Australia has historically been a very constructive voice in the CBD, particularly, you know, in a lot of the uh, interventions that I've witnessed. But more recently, there's been a, a, a quite a significant change. Um, this is pre uh, our federal election, of course. Uh, but recent interventions have caused concern amongst uh, some of our domestic observers. And you can see there that I've just copied some recent text from uh, OEWG3, where Australia wanted to play down the nature of the uh, biodiversity crisis, um, which was very disappointing from our point of view. Now, of course, the new federal government may shift negotiating positions and ambition, and we're very hopeful for that. Um, just like it may be a, play a, a role in resetting the relationships with um, a range of <clears throat> countries. I think it's, uh, it, it, they've made a commitment to be, being more engaged and playing a stronger leadership role, particularly in the CBD. So we'll be watching Nairobi very carefully um, as much as we can from, from where we are. And I guess the, the, the two final lessons that really have stuck with me over the years uh, is that we need to continue as civil society to be engaged, to tell the stories and apply constructive pressure. Because I think if civil society is not, a pa not paying attention, this thing just uh, will kind of operate in policy circles and, and struggle to um, be meaningful 
within the broader the broader community. And I guess the last point is on the broader community. And you know, we know people care about nature. What we're seeing is a disconnect between people understanding that there is a problem happening. And so there's this work that needs to be done with the media, with uh, other sectors, but then also linking that with why things like the CBD and the global biodiversity framework matter is gonna be really important. Um, so I'll leave it there. Hopefully I haven't gone too far over time, um, but thanks very much, Michelle. Thanks so much, James. That was a terrific way to start us off on the conversation. So if anyone has a burning question for James, please put it in the chat box or, or in the Q&A while Paul puts up his slides. But just to, in many ways, respond to what James was talking about in terms of, you know, all of us in the biodiversity space, I think either look longingly or rather jealously at the contrast between how climate is covered versus biodiversity, for example, when the first half of COP15 was ongoing, still ongoing in, in Kunming last year, other, most of my Twitter feed was about, oh, there's this, this other COP that's going on, something to do with climate change, rather than COP15, which was still ongoing. So I note that there's no questions in the chat, in the chat, but really good resources from Liz Bolton in the chat box. So I'll follow up with those later. Um, oh, Q and A question of Q and A. Oh, no, that's not directly uh, related to. But um, before Paul goes on, a quick question for for James from me and something you alluded to, the change of government, a lot of us potentially hopeful because we're um, so used to being in international fora where Australia being, you know, the climate pariah that it was, hopeful that we'll see changes with this new government. What's your sense of going into these next discussion, negotiations in Nairobi? Is it likely that we'll see a change in Australia's negotiating position or, or how Australia conducts itself in the next week? I think, um, look, that's putting, putting me on the spot a bit. I can't speak on behalf of the new government. Um, I'd be hopeful. I look, there. it's actually, I think, a key test is the way mm. I'd think about that. Mm. Um, I'm hopeful we've certainly made representations to the new government. It's certainly been, and it's not just Invasive Species Council, this is across the board of both big international NGOs and domestic NGOs have been um, approaching the new government. They're still getting their feet under mm. the desks and still staffing their offices and still grappling with all the complexities that taking government after nine years in opposition presents. But that being said, we have had uh, some uh, some reassuring, uh, uh, you know, noises from various sectors that you know Australia has been given the Australian delegation has been given, you know, um, an imprimatur to be more ambitious. I think one of the things just on that is that the Australian delegation is very new, and mm. so for a long time, you know, we talk about the CBD club and the CBD family, which is I think really great for negotiating and and trust, um, but there is not, um, for example, Michelle, like the, there isn't a, a, I don't think there's anyone left in the team that was there when OEWG2 OEW was happening from the delegation head down. Wow. And so there's a lot of change. And mm -hmm. so un building those relations, building that understanding of the history and the pathways um, and it takes a lot of time. And so that will also um, be factored in with a, with a new government. And so that's just part of the challenge of, of you know, staff turnover and, and various components. But I'm, I'm hopeful that the new government will um, drive our delegation to be better. Great, great answer and very diplomatically put as well. Thank you, James. We move now to um, my friend and colleague, Paul Govin, who is Deputy Director here at the Centre of Environmental Law, has done 
And what I really like about Paul's work is the way he has this depth of knowledge when it comes to legal theory around values, issues of place on the one hand, and on the other hand, this in-depth knowledge of planning law. So mixing the theoretical and the fundamental with um, very practical issues as well. And what Paul will be talking to us today, I think is very helpful in thinking about how non-state act or, or sub-national state actors, non-sovereign um, actors, I suppose, um, can, can and do have a role in implementing the post-2020 framework when it is concluded, but also in influencing what the outcomes might be. And I know we say we don't talk about climate because we're jealous of, of climate, but in the climate space, you saw at Paris this increasing move to transnationalism. So increasing the, the actors that are all involved in bringing about global change. And a, a huge part of that were subnational governments. And so excited to hear from Paul about assessing biodiversity in the context of extinction under the draft post-2020 GBF and a case study here of New South Wales. Paul. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Thank you for that very lovely introduction. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I'd like to uh, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land uh, where I am presenting from today, the Wallamatical people of the Darug Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I'd also like to thank uh, Ninye um, and Julian Chen especially for their work in uh, getting the, the conference together. Uh, the amazing um, uh, array of speakers, the, the program itself and all the hard work that goes into the administration. And on that front as well, thanks Sarah Vanderfield for her work. Um, uh, before, um, you know, we all sort of uh, take a bit of a break, I think, <laughs> from a couple of big conferences this year already. Okay, so um, my presentation today is, is quite different, probably from the majority of presentations uh, for this conference, um, especially following on from James, even though I think um, he's, his excellent presentation does give me a very solid um, platform. To discuss this, as Michelle said, I've concentrated here on what we'd call subnational governments. And um, again, not to sort of play too much into the climate change law stuff, but uh, the Paris Agreement um, for climate change is particularly uh, uh, has noted the particular role of um, that subnational governments can play um, in in climate change, uh, especially you know with references to the preamble in that document. So um, looking at biodiversity, um, I think there's some very similar and um, revealing parallels that can be drawn. And that's hopefully what I'm going to draw some light on to today. So when I speak about um, New South Wales, uh, so I, I'm, I'm aware, of course, we have a, you know, a truly international global audience. Um, so when I speak about New South Wales, um, obviously uh, a state in Australia, the most you know, populous state, um, and, you know, that's important, I think, from the perspective of, of the biodiversity, what I'll be talking about. Um, I'm concentrating mainly on, on offsetting. So offsetting is a particular technique that has, I think, emerged globally, um, but has taken a particular prominence in Australian uh, laws regulating biodiversity loss and extinction. So um, what I'm trying to do with the paper here is look at to what extent offsetting can help arrest uh, extinction rates as specified under goal A of the draft post uh, 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, uh, which James mentioned. Um, so the connection I'm looking at here, or, or not so much a connection, maybe more of a gap, is between that global ambition regarding extinction and how uh, extinction is managed as a biodiversity or indeed, of course, as, a, as an existential crisis um, at the sub-national level. Now, as I said, my focus here is going to be, be predominantly on um, offsetting. So offsetting in, in the context of, of New South Wales is heavily tied to um, land use planning laws, something Michelle mentioned. 
And it's enlivened in that context. So we don't really speak much about offsetting um, until uh, there is a potential land use which can have impacts on biodiversity. And those impacts uh, are assessed to be of a certain quality, of a certain threshold that could trigger offsetting as part of that development assessment and approval. So what is offsetting? I'm not quite sure how many people are familiar with offsetting, but, but, but quite basically, um, offsetting is a technique, uh, a rationale, if you like, whereby the impacts, uh, the losses on biodiversity at a particular development site are offset by preserving, uh, well, ideally the same, but usually similar biodiversity values elsewhere. So the key thing about offsetting is to try and look elsewhere for those uh, biodiversity values and preserve those um, to offset the loss uh, of biodiversity values at site. So a phrase which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with is no net loss. That is the key thing about biodiversity offsetting, that the uh, land use development and the destruction and loss of biodiversity values is then to be offset and there's to be no net loss across a particular scope. Now, what that scope actually is, is an important part of, of offsetting and an important part of, of law. And one of the things I wanted to sort of take you through is that's not really clear in New South Wales, uh, how that's meant to really work. So one of the things I want to sort of um, stress is the importance of local extinction. The biodiversity um, offsetting as it works in New South Wales is supposed to focus on uh, local extinction. Well, that's, that's how the, the, the sort of the regime is set up. And this complements the way in which land use planning works because land use planning is to be very site specific. So uh, other um, environmental considerations that we might be familiar with, such as environmental impact statements, et cetera, uh, are, are primarily focused on the localized impacts of um, environmental destruction as a result of development. So um, it's important in this regard, I think, before we really set up, um, well, so, you know, important to set up the paper and then as we go further through the analysis, to remember that um, because of the way this regime works, it's very important to not lose sight of local extinction. Now, how local extinction really um, is going to be uh, realized in an offsetting context is a bit of a challenge um, because offsetting is something which, um, as I said a bit earlier, sort of occurs across, can occur across time and space. So when you're looking for an offset site, you are looking necessarily at something that is quite far away from um, the development site itself. So there can be problems here in terms of say the locality of the impact and, and local extinction. Offsetting is to operate at a, at a somewhat uh, abstracted level. And I think what's important here is that when we look at uh, international um, ambitions to halt biodiversity loss and arrest extinction, we, we mustn't be too quick to sort of allow um, these sorts of understandings of biodiversity loss to be too heavily abstracted from the place where the biodiversity impacts are occurring. Now, just another um, point before we move on to the sort of um, analysis. Extinction, whilst it is part of uh, New South Wales planning law and New South Wales laws that regulate biodiversity, it does not necessarily stop a development from being approved. And this is again where offsetting can come to the aid of the, um, of the, of the developer. So the, the inclusion of um, extinction in the context of New South Wales law is not necessarily a um, something yeah, which will stop a development. It's something which needs to be considered in the context of assessing and approving the development. And part of that approval could very well include offsets. So the two uh, points I really want to uh, go through with the, with the following analysis is how extinction informs biodiversity loss under the, the Biodiversity Conservation Act, sorry, that's the BC Act, is the Biodiversity Conservation Act of New South Wales, 2016. And the related bit, 
Uh, what are the implications for this um, in, in terms of the offsetting strategy? A key question, as I've already, I think, mentioned, on what scale is extinction to be considered under the Biodiversity Conservation Act? Now, this is not abundantly clear, and I'll be taking you through the legislation and then uh, two very recent cases from the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, which has started to tackle this question, but not necessarily clarify it um, 100%. Um, all right, so... I'm just sorry, I'm just trying to check quickly check through. Yeah, yeah. So the, the next, the first sort of step here with biodiversity loss and extinction is well, how does the system under the Biodiversity Conservation Act, how is the issue of loss and extinction even revealed in the first place? So tying it again to land use development law, the decision. Uh, which um, has to be made about the, the land use development can fall to a body such as a local council or the New South Wales state government. However, what we must be mindful of is that the biodiversity and extinction um, aspects are considerations as part of this broader overall process. So um, how does this all come about? Well, the key thing is the Biodiversity Development Assessment Report. So under the Biodiversity Conservation Act, there is a, a standard uh, which has to be applied to any development to ascertain what are the impacts of a development or potential impacts that is on uh, biodiversity. Now, the test itself or the threshold can include considerations of extinction. So there we have that relationship between uh, extinction and how extinction can inform biodiversity loss. So once this report is compiled, the decision maker must then look over the report and, and sort of then go, right, well, what are the impacts of this? Uh, do they satisfy the legal threshold test? Um, and, and therefore, should I approve or reject this land use development application? So the um, assessment report is drafted in adherence to what is called the biodiversity assessment methodology. And this is uh, established by the New South Wales government. The first one was done in 2017 for the, for the 2016 legislation, and, and the current one was done in 2020. Now, the reason why I'm going through these documents is because they are all uh, drafted for the purpose of um, informing, uh, first of all, accredited uh, biodiversity, um, uh, well, sorry, biodiversity accreditors, and also the decision makers. So these documents are hugely important in informing our understanding of biodiversity loss and extinction risk. The third document, and this is the one which I think is, is going to be incredibly important uh, from this point forward in terms of biodiversity law and policy in Australia is the serious and irreversible impacts guidance document. So let's just now have a look at very quickly at the legislation. Uh, I don't want to go through this in much detail, but all I'd ask you to, to sort of note here is under six, uh, this is clause 6.7 of the environmental planning and assessment regulation. You'll see here when it talks about an impact on uh, diversity values, it, and it talks about serious and irreversible impact, you'll see there, it, it talks about extinction. So that's sort of the threshold that it's, it's, it's uh, working within. Um, now, the next one here is taken from section 7.3 of the um, Biodiversity Conservation Act. And again, you'll see that this test of likely to significantly affect threatened species is sort of informed, at least can be informed by the risk of extinction. But again, it, it's very vague how this connection works. And again, it's only a consideration that the decision maker must take into account. So to run through these points then, um, and this kind of is just consolidating what I've already said, global extinction targets must acknowledge the local dimension of extinction. So this is you know, incredibly important. However, offsetting tends to then, as I said earlier, abstract biodiversity. It sort of searches for similar biodiversity values across um, a wider space of New South Wales. And also the biodiversity offset does not have to be in available 
at the time of biodiversity loss. It can be way off into the future. And that usually is going to be the case because the biodiversity values will take a long time to sort of not only be located, but to probably mature in a place, in a location where it is then, um, where the offset is then located. So, um, as I said earlier, the, the, the Biodiversity Conservation Act is enlivened by land use development. That tells us one thing already, that, that you know, it's, it's not really a standalone biodiversity protection uh, measure. It's very much connected to this idea of helping developers get legal consent for, the, for their projects, for, for their development projects. Extinction is a consideration only of those tests that I showed you on the previous slide. There's a particularly high threshold regarding the risk of extinction, but it must be likely to significantly affect. So those words, again, set a very high threshold in terms of, well, when is extinction going to be something which is taken into account by, um, by decision makers? The consideration of extinction, even when the evidence is uh, clear, may not stop the development from going ahead. It will in certain cases where the impacts are serious and irreversible, but those will, that will only apply to certain types of development. Development, which we describe as major projects, for instance, which is infrastructure and, and state approved developments don't necessarily have to abide by that uh, consideration. So moving on to the next slide here. Um, as I said, with all land use planning and development law, the assessment site is context specific. Um, the biodiversity values are exchanged across space and time, and this must be balanced against uh, the idea of localized biodiversity loss and the possibility of localized extinction. This issue is going to be exacerbated, uh, and this trend is, um, the, the sort of the, the focus of a number of recent cases um, from the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, where the so-called mitigation hierarchy isn't appropriately, appropriately followed by developers and isn't appropriately uh, regulated by decision makers. So the mitigation hierarchy is very simple. First of all, a developer must avoid biodiversity loss. Secondly, they must minimize biodiversity loss in, in cases where it can't be avoided, and only then are they meant to then look at offsetting. But the problem that we're finding is that a lot of developers are not following this correctly and are going straight to offsetting in order to get their developments approved. The problem here for say local extinction, or local biodiversity loss and local extinction, is that offsetting, as I just tried to explain, does not carry the same sort of reassurance in terms of being able to minimize or arrest uh, biodiversity loss and extinction in local context, because again, of this very abstracted nature. Again, we ask ourselves, well there, what is extinction? How is extinction meant to be understood in the context of New South Wales uh, biodiversity laws and offsetting? So again, the risk of extinction is not that well explained. In, sorry, I know I'm sort of running short on time. The, um, the risk of extinction is not very well explained uh, through the Biodiversity Conservation Act. It is mentioned in the, uh, the document here, the SII guidance document, which again is the Serious Irreversible Impacts document. But again, it's not clear. Is extinction to be assessed at the local level or at the state level? And just very quickly now, what do some of these recent cases from the Land and Environment Court tell us? So these are the two cases which I'm currently sort of researching and analyzing uh, for, the, for the purposes of um, uh, hoping, hoping to get this published, this, this idea published. Both of these cases look at serious and irreversible impact and uh, the consideration of extinction in that context. Both of them look at um, these important provisions. I mentioned this earlier, clause 6.7 of the Biodiversity Conservation Regulations. The first case, the 2021 case, has suggested that in terms of the threshold, the standard might not necessarily require significant contribution, i.e. the um, development doesn't need to show um, a likely and significant contribution to extinction. It might just be the impact itself. So the significant bit doesn't necessarily need to be satisfied in order to refuse consent. 
The second case on the other, uh, other side here, the statewide planning uh, case, which really does adopt a lot from the first one, from the Planners North case, has looked at extinction of the uh, Cumberland woodland in particular, for those of you who, who know of it, and has said that um, the application here, the interpretation of extinction in this context should adopt the precautionary principle approach. Now, this is quite interesting because this might allow uh, consent authorities, i.e. councils, and, and New South Wales government even, to look at a number of other drivers in terms of what could actually be look, driving extinction, not just the development itself, but maybe something like climate change. However, neither of these cases really nail down what is the geographic scope of extinction that's meant to be considered in the context of development. Is it local or state? And so then we come back to this question of, well, how does it help manage and prevent localized extinctions? Okay, thank you everyone for listening. That's, I think I'm gone a bit over time there, but um, thanks and happy, of course, to field or answer any questions. Thanks so much, Paul. So, you know, tackling straight on the most controversial, perhaps, topic in conservation that is offsetting, but at the same time, very much talking to issues of scale, right, that global to local and um, part of why global and international regulation of biodiversity is so difficult. Well, Jiayi, I'll invite you to put your slides up now and I'll take a, um, well, it looks like we've got two questions already and um, from Cassandra McLaughlin and also from Kath Wallace and, and they complement each other. So a uh, question to Paul from um, Kath, I think you can, uh, Paul, I think you can see the question from Kath in the Q&A and the question from Cass in the um, chat box. So the question from Kath is essentially um, clarification around no net, no net loss and what that means for invasive species. So that more technical question on the one hand and complemented very nicely with Cass's question about the abstraction risk of offsetting, right? And uh, I'll read her words because it's been put really nicely here. Nature, especially biodiversity, does not seem to lend itself to the fungibility of accounting. And therefore uh, the question centers around accounting recommendation issued by the most recent Samuel review of the EPBC Act. So if you might, a, a short response to the, those questions and we can pick up on, on them again um, in the main discussion. Okay, thanks, Michelle. And I'll, I'll just go to Kath's question first. Um, thanks, Kath. Um, yeah, so the question here is, um, yeah, areas not threatened to put up for offsets. That's correct. Yeah, so, well, it, it, it kind of is. Um, it's a bit of a, a funny one because generally speaking, um, those people who want to then uh, propose that their land, remember, I should have made this a bit clearer, especially for our international um uh, guess what international being not not you know in the Australian jurisdiction um, offsetting is is to work in the context of private land okay so we have our zero extinction policy in New South Wales but that's sort of contained within national parks etc but yeah so Kath um, you can as a landowner uh, attract um, biodiversity credits on your land um, and then if you know then then you know put up that land as part of the biodiversity offset scheme by doing the things you've, you've actually described. Um, that's actually a really good example. If there are invasive species on your land, if you eradicate those, then um, you could, at least in, in theory, put that up as, as biodiversity um, sort of offset land. Um, of course, it depends on, on the context, depends on you know, what the, the species that's been lost at site actually is. But, but you can actually do that. But I agree with the sort of um, um, overall question, yeah. I mean, the fact that then it's, it's kind of um, the idea that, that you can save land or the, the idea that, that, that land is, is, is going to sort of um, uh, degrade in terms of biodiversity. And, and by, by sort of restoring that somehow, you know, you should be rewarded is, is a bit, strange, but that unfortunately is part of the um, sort of rationale behind the biodiversity offsetting uh, idea. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll quickly go to the other question. If, if, if there's more on that, I'm happy to, to do it later. Sorry, Michelle, where's the other question? Is it in chat, is it? Yeah, it's in the chat, essentially about the non-fungibility of nature. Oh, I see it. Okay, I see it, yeah. Um, 
Mm. So actually, Paul, let's let's leave that to okay. the, the the broader discussion cool, cool. Um, because I can see a lot of great questions coming through, and I, I think we'll pick it up then. So all right, all good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thanks, Cass and and Kath. And I'm delighted to now introduce to you Xu Jiayi, who is the program director of Greenovation Hub, and who is presenting today with um, Jiang Xueyan. Uh, the, the specialist of the biodiversity program. Delighted to have Jiayi with us, who not only brings to this conversation an economic perspective and understanding, but also in terms of a fun fact, has done a, a master's at the University of Queensland, so also really understands the Australia-China context as well. Her, um, she's currently the programs director at Green Innovation Hub, and was also previously a research associate on climate change economics at the World Resources Institute and as um, a special assistant to the chief representative of China. So formerly a project officer of the Institute of Environment and Development. So welcome, Jiayi, very much looking forward to your presentation on mainstreaming nature-based solutions at the COP15. Jiayi, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Liam. So uh, just a little bit <laughs> technical check. So you are looking at um, my slides or my uh, presenter's view at the moment? Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, so you're looking at slides, right? Slides, I can see slides and I can see, um, can see you. Okay, great. <laughs> So thank you very much. And uh, also thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I would like to extend my um, sincere appreciation to Macquarie University and Wuhan University for your invitation and hosting this event. Also um, sending my uh, appreciation to my colleague uh, Jiang Shuyuan who is not presenting today, but uh, uh, today's sharing is based on um, a recent uh, publication that uh, uh, jointly done by her and me, a very specific and unique topic, um, nature-based solution uh, in the COP15 process, which uh, demonstrates how um, ambition, science, uh, implementation, and uh, equity reflects. Um, and I also like to echo um, other speakers regarding that uh, negotiation is uh, just one part of biodiversity efforts. That is, uh, um, um, after all, a science-based action and a policy-driven process uh, aiming for protecting this planet and the human beings. Um, so from, uh, you can see, this is the development of the nature-based solution concept from uh, science and uh, urgencies, um, that uh, uh, research already shows that a uh, nature-based solution could provide around 30% of the cost-effective mitigation that needed by 2030 to stabilize warming to below two degree. Um, they can also provide a powerful defense against the impacts and the long-term hazards of climate change, which is the biggest threat to uh, biodiversity as well, that um, as other speakers mentioned uh, at the beginning, that we are looking at the nexus between biodiversity and uh, climate. From an uh, international process, natural-based solution is one of the area that generates debates in CBD, um, but already fully incorporated into the other process, UNFCCC. A strong recognition from biodiversity side will also help um, send very strong signals to address the importance of um, this nexus. Also, uh, in several countries, uh, including China, the presidency of uh, COP15, nature-based solution is no longer uh, only a concept, but mainstreamed into planning, conservation, uh, mitigation, and the recent release adaptation policies from um, national to subnational levels. Um, and uh, to understand um, the discussions and the debates uh, beside uh, the nature-based solution uh, in the negotiation process. So maybe we need to understand the concept uh, first. 
the emergence of nature-based solution concept in uh, environment and science also uh, came from uh, IUCN and also like World Bank and also um, evaluated uh, with, uh, into several different understandings and uh, concepts. Um, the basic uh, difference between this concept with uh, the conventional engineering um, interventions um, is that um, it's uh, based on mainly the power and uh, um, uh, re regenerates from the nature itself. The timeline highlights the major uh, milestones in the NBS concept and also the latest, uh, the most recent um, development uh, this year is in the union that in Nairobi this year uh, finally adopts the uh, concept from um, uh, IOCN. So the definition, the recent adoption that, as I mentioned in UNIA, that um, provides a, an, a, an internationally agreed understanding of this concept as uh, MBS enters into policy and uh, adopt by projects on the ground. Um, there is a pressing need for greater clarity what the concept uh, entails and what is required it to be uh, deployed successfully. Um, so, um, based on the concept, uh, uh, IUCN and several other uh, international organizations also further developed the standards of uh, nature-based solution. The uh, standards uh, consist of uh, eight criteria and uh, 28 uh, inch, um, indicators, as you can see that in the center. Uh, for criteria one, the societal challenges, which is as a core, um, um, alongside with others include um, the governance, uh, scaling up, uh, net gain, um, uh, adaptive management, mainstream and the sustainability. So uh, when we talk about nature-based solutions in um, uh, GBF, uh, so we mainly talk about two uh, targets that we are talking about. Um, maybe this part is a little bit boring, but we can see how uh, interesting the, the, the negotiation is going. So uh, the first one is uh, the, the first one is in target eight. Uh, the inclusion of uh, MBS in target eight is talking about, the, to minimize the uh, impact of climate change in biodiversity contribute to uh, mitigation and uh, based on ecosystem-based approaches contributing to at least 10 gigatons. Um, so uh, the red ones are where the um, negotiations and uh, uh, arguments that are based on. So there are mainly three uh, arguments regarding this target. The first is, um, some countries that uh, uh, do not agree that insert nature-based solutions into GBF uh, because uh, currently we have ecosystem-based approaches and also some countries um, also suggested to use resilience instead of uh, ecosystem-based or nature-based solutions to uh, make sure it reflects better regarding the uh, nexus between climate and biodiversity. Also, the second uh, debate comes from the, uh, the number. So um, people are talking about the different types of numbers. Someone, uh, uh, some parties that uh, uh, suggest to use a proportional uh, number or maybe uh, some that suggest not using qu uh, quantifiable numbers. And also the, uh, here that uh, emphasize uh, 10 gigaton uh, CO2 per year that is based on um, uh, some researches, but also uh, from uh, NGOs and from a science perspective that uh, um, we're suggesting that maybe 10 gigaton is not enough. That as mentioned earlier that IOCN and also Oxford University published um, that um, NBS can contribute to 30% of um, 
the uh, the, the global uh, mitigation. So uh, it is not 10 gigaton. It, it should be around 32 gigatons per year. So um, maybe to have a more ambitious target here uh, could reflect from um, uh, different stakeholders um, uh, perspective. And also um, the last uh, argument here is around the negative impact on biodiversity. So the um, uh, because the NBS is a relatively new concept and also a lot of uh, countries and parties that uh, um, uh, claim um, um, it is not clear uh, about the boundary of this project or how to identify. Um, so it might uh, generate some uh, negative impacts on biodiversity, even it is a, a mitigation, a climate mitigation project, for example, the, um, we all know that some large scale uh, renewable uh, constructions that still has a potential uh, negative impact on biodiversity and how to manage that. So um, that is the arguments um, around uh, target eight. And also the next uh, target that uh, focus on uh, uh, talking about nature-based solution is uh, target 11. So uh, currently the tax is, uh, in GBF is maintaining and enhance nature's contribution to regulation of air quality and water and protection from hazards e extreme events to all people. So for these, um, the arguments around two issues. Still, the first is regarding whether to use nature or use ecosystem services or use biodiversity itself. So um, uh, at the moment, and especially in uh, Geneva, um, some parties that already suggested to change it to ecosystem services. So maybe from the next version that we'll see the ecosystem services here rather than nature um, itself to make sure that uh, it is more uh, clear that um, as a target. And the second is um, in, in this, um, in target 11. So the target 11, um, uh, the purpose of target 11 means to uh, reflect those targets and uh, uh, contents that not uh, mentioned in previous targets, especially in target eight, nine, and 10. However, that uh, uh, we didn't see any uh, quantifiable numbers here. And uh, um, also from the other side, um, all the contents here is really difficult to quantify the outcomes, um, especially for the um, protecting and hazards and the extreme events to all people. So the quantifiable, if it, it is not uh, feasible at the moment, or even if we give it a number, uh, it might um, underpin the actual effects of uh, all of these um, issues. So um, these are the two major um, arguments that uh, contains um, uh, uh, nature-based solutions in GBF. So um, I, I think the uh, challenges that the major uh, difficulty comes in identifying appropriate uh, indicators um, and the metrics for social ecological effectiveness of nature. So um, uh, what uh, counts as uh, effective depends on the perspective and the needs of um, those already uh, involved. Um, and the second is uh, lack of uh, funding. Um, only 5% uh, uh, of uh, climate finance goes to um, uh, related areas and the less than 1% goes to uh, coastal protection infrastructure disaster, disaster risks that uh, are including in nature-based solutions. So a uh, lack of funding is a, a major issue that to make sure NBS is an implementable um, target that's included in GBF. And also um, the, the third 
is the concerns around uh, project identification, as mentioned. Um, uh, some NGOs and developing countries that worried it is another uh, greenwash concept that included into uh, this process. And also the, because uh, there are other several uh, ongoing uh, international processes re re um, related to biodiversity, to emphasize uh, biodiversity and the climate nexus. So um, they don't want to uh, include include a new concept and uh, a numeric, numerical number here to underpin the efforts that's in other process. Um, but still, uh, what's good that we are looking into all of these negotiations. Um, they are not just the game of uh, playing words that putting um, um, a lot of negotiators are not uh, sitting together just to uh, edit and revise a word document. Um, and that is that when we discuss about what should be put into these two targets uh, regarding nature-based solution, is a common uh, recogni uh, recognition of this biodiversity climate nexus. And we do want to see it uh, play an effective role uh, into this process. And uh, when we discuss about um, uh, the negotiation that we need to look also look at what happening that uh, within the country. So from China's perspective, why uh, China is promoting nature-based solutions, not only uh, in, in China, but also in several international occasions. Um, the first thing that uh, the concept is aligned um, with uh, the mutual contributions um, 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 from uh, both uh, climate side and the biodiversity conservation side. And also the second that now China is from a top-down um, uh, mechanism that uh, adopting the uh, what we call green gold and the ecological civilization as a, a political philosophy to uh, for uh, the development. So that's why we um, we mentioned that maybe the mainstream of uh, MDS and also biodiversity uh, into the policy side is ongoing. And the second, uh, uh, the, the third is regarding the incre uh, integrated policy implementation. It is not only in conservation itself and it is not on climate itself. It is also uh, everywhere in the economic and the social uh, planning perspectives in, in China. Um, and that reflects the uh, eight criteria that NBS already uh, included, especially on societal and uh, um, uh, societal uh, and uh, other uh, challenges. So, lastly, at risk awareness of co-benefits. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, from the policy perspective, I I think previous uh, speakers already mentioned about uh, non. Uh, government stakeholders that uh, their actions. So here um, I'll start from the policy perspective. Um, so the first that as mentioned, uh, several uh, MBS projects already included into the 14th five-year plan from uh, national economic and social development perspectives. And also um, um, the goal is set to uh, the vision 2035. So it is uh, pretty much a longer term go rather than a short term to echoing um, maybe uh, uh, from to, to the international pressures. It is more like a, um, a domestic needs to uh, implement this type of project. And also uh, the second into the uh, national land and space planning system and into uh, annual work reports and white papers on climate and uh, biodiversity. And uh, the uh, recent policy that is developed really rapidly, so it's in integrated into um, the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment, and also from um, the State Council's uh, development uh, plans perspective into the national um, Development and the Reform Commission, and also uh, into the Ministry of Finance regarding um, uh, more and diverse financing uh, uh, mechanisms. And uh, also there are 
uh, ongoing practices here uh, in China. Uh, long from um, long term ago, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, we already have the three North Shelf Belt program. It is called uh, like a new green great wall in, in China that uh, devoting to uh, desert um, um, mitigation and uh, governance. And also the second is green for uh, a green pro program. It is that uh, to uh, improve um, the quality of uh, farming and agriculture methods in the uh, desert areas. Um, and also uh, much of uh, China's application of NBS is in urban areas um, that uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people already heard. Uh, there's an initiative called Sponge City that started from uh, 2014. Um, it, it is aiming to leverage the benefits of nature-based solution that uh, to make sure the 80% uh, of the urban areas is uh, sponge-like. So it means um, the surface water to prevent the surface water uh, flooding and uh, also to improve the purification of urban runoffs, uh, enhancing water conservations. Um, etc. And also, especially uh, Sponge City Initiative is uh, upgrading the um, uh, city's um, resilient infrastructures um, for community health and also economic development. Um, and lastly, um, as uh, previous speakers mentioned about the non-stakeholders uh, practices um, from China and that um, there are several uh, business and financial sectors uh, and also from civil society's uh, contribution that uh, um, are the alliance and uh, different initiative already uh, started uh, from um, maybe two years ago. That uh, um, especially that some uh, really new um, pra investment practices and uh, exists here uh, in China. Uh, including issuing uh, biodiversity bonds, blue bonds, and also um, integrate um, uh, carbon offsets or, or from the um, um, carbon sequestration projects into um, uh, like uh, national parks development and uh, several other uh, initiatives. And uh, the next uh, steps for uh, mainstream uh, MBS into the uh, CBD COP15 process. Um, here are just some thoughts. So firstly, it is should not only in the targets, but also should be included into um, the NBSAP, the National uh, Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans um, as very uh, important components. We already see um, uh, NBS in the uh, NDC uh, targets from different countries and especially from uh, China's uh, NDC. Um, so it will be uh, great that we can see um, the uh, NBS in the updated NBSAP from different countries. And the second, um, still the enhanced political willingness and the international collaborations still um, as a core um, to the uh, international um, process, even that we are doing a lot domestically uh, without uh, in international collaborations and the political willingness, it is not a commitment or to make sure an ambitious uh, GBF could be made uh, at the international level. And from uh, domestic actions that first we make need to make sure NBS project standards to make sure it is concrete, um, and uh, uh, viable, and the second to especially uh, uh, establish the MRV system um, and to uh, in, in accordance with what uh, GBF will list as a goals. And the third is to increase um, the carbon sinks, um, not only um, the conservation areas uh, or, or the key biodiversity areas, but also in cities, in priority areas, and also in ocean that should be included and emphasized domestically. And also uh, the last two is to avoid biodiversity loss from renewable and mitigation measures that we know uh, from the engineer perspective, um, 
um, the balance still need to uh, make that domestic from regulation or policy side and uh, actions from all stakeholders and the entire society still um, should be the core of um, the MBS and uh, the biodiversity uh, conservation efforts. So lastly, I would like to thank you all of you that uh, having me here again. And uh, the, uh, this paper is uh, something that we're doing at the moment jointly with IUCN to analyze the responses from globally to the first draft of uh, GBF. Um, and uh, it is not published yet, but uh, a natural based solution is uh, one of the 10 major issues that we analyzed in this um, uh, report and uh, hopefully we will uh, release it in maybe one month's time. So, uh, and uh, thank you very much <laughs> again. Um, and uh, I welcome any questions uh, you have and hopefully uh, we're looking for further collaborations in the future, thank you. Thanks so much, Xiaoyi, and very much touching on that really critical issue of the biodiversity um, climate nexus, right? That if there's global assessment identified that climate change is already the third most important driver of biodiversity loss, the IPBES IPCC report after that going, well, this century it could become the key driver of biodiversity loss. So on the one hand, critically important, but on the other hand, seeing these really important links with the with what has already been said today. Um, Paul, for example, I know has done a lot of work comparing what um, the lack of links across the UNFCCC and the CBD. I was also reminded as you were speaking of what James was talking about earlier about the move um, to not quantify targets, so seeing a lot of really interesting links there. Um, while Sarah's putting up these short slides, I, there is a question um, for you, Jiayi, in the Q&A, essentially a clarifying question about nature-based solutions and whether the aim is to keep um, nature in its native state? And if so, why there's a lack of funding for this approach? Okay, so um, let, um, I, I think from my understanding of this very um, new concept is to let nature play a bigger nature's role um, to uh, mitigate and also to um, not not only to climate, but also to for biodiversity conservation. Uh, from this perspective that we have at, uh, implemented in uh, agriculture, fishery, uh, forestry, um, and uh, several other areas. But the thing is that uh, uh, we're still facing a huge biodiversity conservation con um, a gap uh, annually that uh, and uh, almost 80, 70% uh, of that comes from uh, public funding and only less than 30% from the private sector. So facing the huge uh, challenge of uh, funding um, that we can not only let government increase budget or, or printing more money to, to, for, for conservation, but also that using different uh, methods like green finance and uh, some innovative, um, uh, like offsetting that mentioned these kind of mechanisms to make sure that it generates more funding for this um, enormous funding gap. And why it is still a uh, lack for, of funding, I think um, there are major two reasons. The first is, um, the funding gap still exists not only in climate and also in biodiversity. Um, and uh, we still need to generate um, uh, more funding to reach um, the target. And the second um, is um, MBS project uh, is quite uh, unique um, that the pricing of MBS project so far it is either only reflects the value from um, climate or reflects the value from biodiversity itself. But if it is uh, something um, 
combined both benefits um, that should be reflected in the pricing. Um, the value should be adding up, um, but so far that um, is not working in this way at the moment. So it also uh, related to evaluation, pricing, and if there's a market for uh, nature-based solution projects that can fully um, recognize and reflect uh, its value. So um, yeah, I guess that's another reason of the funding issue. So, um, but I'm sure in the future, this kind of uh, cross-cutting and uh, mu uh, um, that projects generate uh, mutual benefits um, will generate more attention, not only from the public side, but also from um, the uh, various uh, innovative uh, green finance areas. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Jai. And, and I'm excited to now introduce to you Li Shuo, who is the Senior Global Policy Advisor at Greenpeace China. And excited because I'm already um, in, in the chat box, which, which uh, in the panelist chat box, which some of you don't get to see, already seeing uh, short responding to a lot of the things that have been discussed already. And Li Shuo is the Senior Global Policy Advisor at Greenpeace China. And he's worked with the UNFCCC, the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, the Uni United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So bringing a perspective from across a range of conventions to look at the challenges and the opportunities for the Kunming process. Michelle, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Michelle. Uh, I hope the IT uh, is, uh, is working for us here. Uh, I have a little bit of an internet problem, so, uh, Sarah will be uh, going through uh, my slides, which will actually make this a true uh, Sino-Australian uh, cooperation. Um, at the outset, let me uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, Nangye, and colleagues at the Wuhan University for uh, inviting me for this uh, timely conversation. It is actually a very good way uh, to start our week on this important topic, and also in light of uh, this uh, upcoming CBD negotiation uh, in Nairobi. Let me just uh, try to be very brief over the next 10 minutes or so uh, to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that we observe uh, in the ongoing CBD equipment process. Sorry if we could uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so just um, a few um, uh, a brief background. As James has already mentioned, um, when we look at the CBD and in comparison with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, we will realize that the CBD is a relatively smaller and weaker convention. Um, this is, I think, just a fact. Uh, I think for intellectuals and academias, uh, it is actually a quite interesting um, uh, uh, topic of study. Why has this been the case? I have two personal hypotheses. I think there are more explanations. But number one, uh, I think biodiversity probably is intrinsically a less international environmental issue. Not saying it is not an international environmental issue, but less so compared to climate change. Panda extinction probably bothers only China, um, you know, as opposed to uh, uh, people elsewhere in the world. The second hypothesis um, is uh, just when you look at the, um, the, uh, the birth of the three so-called real conventions, the UNFCCC, CBD, and the Convention on uh, you know, Desertification, uh, CBD and the, and the Desertification Convention um, were sort of a trade-off that developed countries gave to developing countries in order to reach the climate convention. So there, you know, that's sort of the politics 30 plus years ago when the CBD was born. So we are in the, uh, in the Kunming courses now, which is uh, sort of a continuation of this decadal exercise of the CBD in setting goals and targets, biodiversity protection goals and targets. As James has already mentioned, the last round that we had in Aichi covering the time period of 2010 to 2020 uh, has largely failed. Most of the car targets were not fully delivered. The current Kunming courses uh, was officially started in late 2018 uh, at the last COP in Egypt. Um, it was intended to 
to be an intensive two-year negotiation process that will outline you know, a new, new decadal biodiversity protection framework. But of course, as we were roughly halfway into the Kunming process uh, in February 2020, uh, COVID-19 disrupted this political process. Um, and since then, uh, most of the negotiations had to be done online. Um, and from Tuesday on this week, uh, we will have the last face-to-face -face preparatory session in Nairobi, uh, which will hopefully give uh, the preparatory work a, a, a boost. And also just about 20, uh, sorry, 12 hours ago, uh, a new decision was made by the CBD Bureau to move the COP from Kunming to Montreal in December. Well, China will still uh, maintain, retain uh, the role of, uh, you know, chairmanship for, uh, the, you know, for the rest of the courses. We can go to the next slide uh, to talk about um, uh, some, of the, um, some of the challenges uh, that we have in this, uh, in this Kunming process. So far, um, the, um, the climbing process has not been very well organized, if I have to provide a very honest uh, assessment. Uh, a lot of the agenda and the sequencing between different agenda items have not been poorly, you uh, have not been very well designed. And um, we also saw some relatively poor chairing across uh, throughout the climbing process. Uh, the secretariat uh, it faces low uh, capacity. Uh, the documents that they have been producing um, sometimes are, are quite flawed. Uh, and there has also been a lot of internal turnovers within the secretariat. The presidency uh, is rather low profile. We haven't seen uh, a lot of very visible leadership or steer uh, from China so far in the courses. And also um, the, the whole courses in the CBD convention suffers uh, from low political attention. Uh, other than, uh, for example, the environmental ministers sort of name checking the word biodiversity, we have hardly seen any kind of real and meaningful high level direct engagement. Um, and, and also the equipment exercise is actually quite fixated on goals and targets. As we all know, this is the important part of the post-2020 biodiversity package. It tells us where we need to be uh, in 10 years time. But I would argue what's more important is probably how do we actually get there? And that part is not uh, meaningfully addressed so far uh, in the Kunming round. Um, and also in, in relation to that, um, very low attention on implementation and finance. And this risks us to replicate, not go beyond, replicate what we had uh, in Aichi. So overall, uh, I have um, covered, um, I think the last 12 climate cops, uh, saw those cops kind of in the run up to the critical moment, normally in November, December every year. Uh, and if I would compare to the preparatory courses in the UNFCC to where we are in Kunming, I think we are quite underprepared. Uh, even at this late stage. I saw many issues, both at the technical level, but also at the political level, uh, not maturing enough uh, to, uh, to kind of fulfill a, an ambitious and successful COP. Uh, last word here, um, I just mentioned the COP15 arrangement was just decided, but there are still many remaining issues. The detailed modalities of the, of the COP uh, what will be the implications of this replication uh, of, of this relocation, the COVID measures, the level of participation, and who will be there uh, as a result as a result of the uh, the relocation? Uh, let me shift to the more positive side opportunities. Next slide. Um, I think there there are a few. Even though, as you could probably sense, I'm I'm carrying a rather cautious, uh, optimistic or cautious pessimistic tone here. Uh, I think you know the good things. Number one, there's still some political and media attention. I hope this latest decision to relocate the COP will give the process more attention that it deserves. Um, I hope this attention will be able, will be enough to revamp the Kunming deal. Um, you know, uh, I think James mentioned that um, very few journalists. 
uh, are on this beat, uh, but I hope you know, just based on, you know, further engagement over the next few months, we will get more of them paying attention uh, to the upcoming COP in Montreal. Uh, as many of you know, one of the most important targets that we're discussing in the current criminal round is the so-called 30 by 30 target, namely to protect at least 30% of, you know, global areas on land and uh, over, over, the, uh, over the seas by 2030. Uh, I don't think this target, uh, you know, this target has received 100% buy-in from all the parties. But if I would compare where we are now to two to three years ago, I think we have made great progress. I see more countries jumping on board with this idea, uh, and I hope um, the momentum that we will be able to garner uh, all the way uh, to Montreal will help us finally decide on such a target. Uh, and I also hope that this Kunming round, very importantly and different from the last Aichi round, will establish the stronger link between the global targets and the national ones. James has mentioned in his presentation that in the Aichi round, we were basically having two layers. We spent two years negotiating the Aichi global targets. There were 20 uh, you know, of them, and then countries went back home and did their own thing. So these two uh, layers, the international and the domestic, were in many cases completely detached from each other, which is on one hand, a big waste of international time and energy, right? Given that we, we invested two years of diplomatic efforts to negotiate those IG targets, but also you know, a missed opportunity for important countries to advance their domestic biodiversity protection agenda, I hope, the Kunming round will help us address that gap. There is a very strong demand now in the uh, negotiations to have countries to come up with national targets, you know, to uh, correspond or to, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, be in accordance with every single one of the global targets. So. For example, if we have a 30 by 30 global coming target, every single country, Australia, China, Switzerland, will need to answer, what's the percentage of your protection within your jurisdiction on land and in the seas? It, it is all, all right for Switzerland to say, not applicable to us for the ocean target, but they are obliged to at least respond to that global target. I think it is a very important one, that close link needs to be ensured and those national targets will need to be tabled rather soon after COP15. Uh, and I, I also think uh, over the next six months, there is still a last chance for us to put some meaningful public international finance on the table. As some of you know, uh, during the first part of the COP15 in Kunming last year in October, uh, the host country, uh, provided, established a Kunming Biodiversity Fund, put in an init initial offer of, 23rd, uh, of 230 million US dollars into that fund, and also called for others to contribute, either in the fund or just broadly, you know, through the, the different other uh, international biodiversity fi financial channels. That offer, that um, invitation has not been responded well by others which is uh, a source of concern, but also I hope it is an opportunity for us uh, to bridge that gap. Uh, if we can turn to the next slide, please. Um, and this, um, um, this will be my last slide, just uh, uh, some way forward thoughts and advice for maybe researchers and scholars, uh, maybe two topics that could be of interest. I mean, from a practitioner point of view, I think it will, it will be great for someone to dig into those two topics. Number one, how does the global forces um, you know, interact with national policy making in the case of CBD and the current Kunming round? I think different countries tend to have a different situation, but I think the bottom line message here is we need to link the domestic decision making, the domestic target setting with the global one. Otherwise, the CBD uh, you know, risks to become a rather shallow and hollowed forces. Number two, 
uh, can we compare UNFCs and CBD? Not just you know the facts, you know the um, the the surface that we can all see, but also uh, but also digging into some of the fundamental factors that led these two processes over the last thirty years to become very different uh, political exercises. And I'm not saying the UNFCC is solving the one point five degree question, um, but it appears that in many regards it has been uh, more well functioning compared to the CBD. Uh, my last question, I think, was largely uh, answered uh, by James. And in the, in the, in the pre previous Q&A section, I was just also wondering what would be the new approach of the new Australian administration. I think a key question actually to ask them is once we get the, uh, you know, once we get the global targets done in December this year, how long will it take them to translate those global targets into Australian domestic targets and what will be the quality and level of ambition in those targets. Uh, with that, thanks very much and turning back to you, uh, Michelle. Thanks so much, Li Shua. That was an excellent and incisive uh, um, an interrogation of where we really need to go, how we can learn from the UNFCCC. And I really like your point about thinking about international law even though you didn't use those words, but it's very much about how can we think about international law in a way that facilitates also thinking about national laws in terms of national level implementation when you highlighted the need for addressing both global level targets, but addressing that at the national level. I am aware that we are on one o'clock, but I beg all of your forgiveness and understanding and let's extend this session until 10 past one. So we might have some discussion between our fantastic panelists. And on that, I'll get, uh, I'll ask James, Paul and Jia Yi to come, come onto the, the panel. And first, uh, um, burning question to Li Shuo and building on, on that point about global and national targets. What sort of hope do you have for how this might um, come to be in um, December? Sure, Michelle. I, I think, um, um, I guess if I would take a, a step back, um, I think, and, and, and just to kind of reflect, the, the Kuomin courses so far from a more intellectual point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I think we actually did not do a very good job in initiating or proposing some of the Kuomin targets in the first place. And also, I, I think that that comment would be applicable to the previous Aichi targets as well. Uh, I think part of the reason that these global targets were not fully translated into domestic setting was because they were, the, you know, the global targets were not designed well enough to facilitate that translate, you know, translation. Um, and, and I think here, uh, you know, I am relatively a newcomer to the CBD. I only started to cover the courses, uh, you know, in 2018. Uh, but when I kind of step into the CBD, the question that I ask myself is, it seems there, there could be two choices in front of us. One is the CBD as a convention, as, a, as an international legal instrument. Just really focus on that three things or five things, right? Mm -hmm. That you can really do and really do well. The five things or three things that are well within the jurisdiction of the ministries that are in charge of the CBD and are kind of, you know, uh, 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 fit based the capabilities that the parties involved with the CBD. Or another choice is we can have that 30, you know, targets or 20, 25 targets, right? That are, that are all perfect, that are all perfect. But at the end of the day, also realizing that a lot of those targets will go beyond the limit of the, the ones that are involved in the CBD. So which pathway do you go? If I would make, you know, need to make the shot in 2018, or let's say in 2006, in the run up to Aichi, I would probably argue, let's just focus on the three that we could really, really deliver. I also didn't see, you know, more than five targets from the UFCC, by the way. So, uh, uh, but, but I think, you know, from a practical point of view, we have long gone beyond that station, right? It is basically setting soon that we will have, well, Aichi had 20, but now the funny thing is 
we have 20 plus. And if you would ask me, I mean, this is rather a geeky note. I can't actually tell you how many targets we have, for example, in the first draft. We seems to have 21 targets and then a few goals and you know, milestones. Do they count as targets or not? So it's in a way a messier situation than Aichi. Uh, but I, I think just to answer your question directly, in Montreal, a commitment through a card decision by all parties to translate the global targets into their national, you know, national targets within one year after COP15. That's what we need to see, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. And I can see James nodding along there. I think I might pose a, a rather broad question for each of you to think about and answer however you wish as we bring this session to a close. Very short reflection on the theme of this conference. Given the range of challenges we're seeing at international level, we're also, as has come up in each of your presentations, the importance of the, the national level, the importance of subnational governments, whether it's the state of New South Wales, whether it's urban biodiversity that, that Jiayi highlighted. I wonder if you both might, and I realize I'm putting James on the, the spot again, because uh, I'll start with James and go in the order that we all went in. If you both might, Think about how Australia and China, what are some of the opportunities to feed into both the international, but importantly, the transnational process for biodiversity in the context of the global biodiversity framework? And you can have 30 seconds to think about it if you like, James, but over to you. I'm, I'm not sure I'm the <clears throat> most qualified in terms of uh, offering an opinion on on that I guess it's just from my where I sit which is um I haven't so Australian the Australian delegation didn't make it to uh, COP14 in Egypt and um to a large extent the Chinese delegation didn't make it to OEWG2 and I think part of the uh steps forward would be kind of uh I haven't been privy to you know what the Australian delegations operations have been but you know as we kind of uh, uh, set up this conversation um improving dialogue and engagement kind of facilitating those discussions across parties um that I'm, I'm guessing haven't really happened in the same way that Australia sits in the Just Cans um alliance um mm -hmm. so for those who aren't familiar that's a, this is just a geopolitical block um it, so I, I guess facilitating that exchange, I couldn't just uh, reiterate, I agree 100% with everything that Shroz just said, like that's, let's kind of hit the nail on the head and, um, you know, how do we make this a more effective agreement and think about what it means for domestic implementation is going to be a really big challenge in the running now to Montreal in December. Um, I think the horse is bolted. It's going to be a complex. It's going to be. It's going to be a complex agreement. There's going to be 21 plus targets, most likely, in there. And I, I guess the question is, can the world really, like, not just Australia and China, because mm. when we unpack that, just really quickly, that it's a lot of different state parties want to see their issue manifest in the treaty, and so that's why it becomes in a sense, Frankenstein's monster, where you've just got lots of different components bolted on and they're all really important. But I think we haven't learnt the lesson from Aichi that we've made, a, we, we haven't simplified it and made it uh, easy to communicate treaty uh, or, or framework. We've actually probably overcomplicated it. And that's just been the, I guess, a lack of uh, directional leadership. A lot of the, a lot of the um, crit critiques that Shroz, um highlighted. So, taking a step back and working out how we're going to actually use this to drive domestic change is going to be, I think, the really significant challenge from, from here on in, uh, assuming we get a strong and ambitious agreement out of it. Great. Thanks, James. Paul. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to really build on what James said, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, as as well versed as others in terms of the negotiation process um, that's, you know, currently ongoing and hopefully will culminate uh, toward the end of the year. 
I think, though, from my perspective of sub-national government um, in a country like Australia, it's absolutely essential. Um, again, as James mentioned in his presentation, um, Australia really lacks any sort of national presence when it comes to environmental lawmaking. It is all sub-national, so that's an important uh, point that should really be emphasised, at least in a similar way to the Paris Agreement, where that is, as I mentioned, um, emphasised in the in the preamble. Of, I mean, it's not you know hugely significant in that binding sense, but it, but it's there. <clears throat> and so I think that sub-national level is is hugely important. I think as well why. Another couple of reasons and looking at it from a, a treaty perspective, localized impacts um, and localized responses really are also, I think are in some ways more important in global South contexts, because it's particularly here where we see that relationship um, between environmental degradation and livelihood, uh, I think in a, in a much more sort of immediate kind of proximity. So I think that um, what we're seeing in Australia, perhaps um, this sub-national approach or, or even by accident, we need to ensure that that is something which is um, uh, mainstreamed a little more uh, deliberately, I think, especially through the Global South, because it's really important. Like as someone said, I think it was uh, Cass in the question said, you know, this, this idea of abstraction, which biodiversity is all, uh, offsetting is all about, um, you know, this, this is a market mechanism. And so um, James again mentioned the um, uh, TFI ND in his presentation. And, and that's really interesting. And I don't know the direct result there in terms of biodiversity, but that's all about transparency. And when we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about abstraction. I think that gets further and further away. Uh, the, you know, the transparency, how transparent some of these um, offsets and biodiversity uh, offsetting loss is. So those sorts of things would be what I um, would kind of, that, that would be my response to the question. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, you and then you sure. Um, thank you. So uh, based on, um, <laughs> I, I think already, um, uh, previous speakers already provide some answers. So uh, maybe from, um, I'll, I'll just maybe, um, adding some uh, concrete initiatives to it. Uh, firstly, uh, from a policy side, um, um, biodiversity um, is not mainstreamed enough. Um, although uh, I mentioned that it is already uh, included in the planning and in several other domestic um, economic and uh, social development planning process, but uh, um, we can say it is uh, mainstreamed already because we don't have concrete um, uh, regulations or uh, the guidelines when biodiversity issues meet other uh, economic development or, or financial um, uh, like investment, these um, issues. So um, uh, I guess further that to have uh, TNFD, maybe localized uh, in China or the from the financial uh, regulator side that uh, they really um, um, uh, build uh, comprehensive, um, not only to prevent biodiversity risks in investment, but also uh, to create more um, innovative um, biodiversity performance related uh, uh, financial products would be uh, a good way to uh, solve um, the biodiversity funding gap issues, uh, as mentioned. And the second is, um, I, I do feel a little bit um, uh, upset that Kwame is not hosting uh, this event anymore because when we mentioned, um, uh, I'm not sure how many of you were here last year in Kwame on site. If you're going to, if you were in the city, the whole city is decorated anywhere. Uh, on the streets, um, since you get off the plane, the logo of biodiversity mm -hmm. and also um, the, the uh, concepts of biodiversity and the protect nature is everywhere in the city. Uh, even when you walk through the pedestrian path, it is printed uh, on the road. So um, for a lot of uh, residents in, in China, in Kunming, and when we mention about the whole society approach to biodiversity conservation, 
this kind of awareness building that is really needed for um, uh, citizens, especially uh, not only in the urban area, but also in rural areas as well. Um, so uh, as uh, non-stakeholders, uh, uh, no, non-government stakeholders, I, I, I still think that uh, to keep raising the awareness and uh, to build um, the collaboration and the relationship between uh, um, from the uh, personal and the civil society's perspective would be um, a great uh, uh, asset to biodiversity conservation process. And also um, the last is, as mentioned that uh, um, the joint research, uh, not only in uh, science, but also in the uh, policy side would still as the domestic drive to um, making sure uh, the final GBF is uh, implementable or it is um, at, or also uh, it reflects the highest ambition of the country that in the MBSAP. So hopefully uh, we can drive, uh, if we are not uh, unable, um, if we are unable to drive uh, a significant change in the framework of GBF, maybe uh, we can still push uh, different countries to make sure an updated MBSAP um, is implementable and reflects the highest ambition of each country as what um, uh, different countries have done in NDC. So yeah, that's um, just <laughs> some reflections from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Yai. And Shaw, with the final word to you. Yeah, no, uh, just very quickly, I, I, I think just, you know, both countries doing their domestic fair share, as I mentioned, the national targets after uh, COP15, but also to consider uh, updating and revising their, their MB SAPs. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think maybe, you know, a, a new rhetoric from the new administration uh, in Australia would be quite, uh, quite helpful in the CBD. Um, you know, the level of participation at COP15 from Australia, I think that's, that's something that, um, you know, Australian side can consider um, putting more finance on the table. And also um, maybe some bilateral dialogues, you know, for, you know, for example, just on site uh, or, you know, on, on, on an intersectional basis on specific issues between the two countries. Um, the issue of IPLC, indigenous people and local communities, Oh, I think uh, Shaw did Morning. say he had internet issues. Oh, he's back. <laughs> we missed you for oh, five seconds. You were on IPL. Sorry. Time. Yes, just the, the issue of indigenous people and local communities uh, to help the Chinese side understand why this issue is important for uh, Australia. And very lastly, when we talk about diversity protection and bilateral cooperation, it goes beyond CBD, right? I mean, there are many other conventions and international processes on migrate, you know, migratory species. I know that we'll be talking about BBNJ, Kamla, the ocean related conventions. I think there are a lot of things to explore uh, in those fora. Thanks. Great, and, and what a great note to end on. 2 p.m. is our next session. And yes, there's far more to biodiversity than, than just the CBD. Thank you all for bearing with us, for being part of this wonderful discussion that we've had today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm sure many of the people listening have as well. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers and see you back here at two o'clock uh, Sydney time and 12 o'clock Beijing time. And I know I'm keeping you from lunch, so I won't say any more. Thank you again. <laughs> Bye.